This part of the session is going through medication error cases. And it, you know, if you look at them in isolation, it kind of makes healthcare in Canada look horrible and miserable, but it's not. So this is selection bias here. So these are the sort of more dramatic ones, incidents that we get, or the more dramatic cases or the things we, you know, it's as at ICMP Canada or as healthcare workers, we can learn the most from. Um, and it's important, I think, too, to realize that uh, all of these cases are real. They actually caused harm to people, and some people uh, died from these cases or from these incidents, and some of them lived, but, but they affected a lot of people. I'll talk a bit as well about Canada. We are a nation of 36 million people in total, most of which live in a squished part 200 kilometers from uh, the U.S. border. Um, we have a very high immigration rate. We're expected to get about 500,000 Im immigrants a year um, in the uh, upcoming year, which should settle about 350,000 is the goal. Um, and that leads to a lot of interesting healthcare scenarios, in particular with respect to uh, patient literacy or healthcare literacy, health literacy. So trying to um, assimilate all these people into the Canadian healthcare system, which is often very difficult. And these are often very vulnerable people. So we do have significant problems. Um, Canada's sort of GDP output is, is mostly industrial and oil. Um, we do have a lot of uh, other um, areas of uh, economic output like forestry and minerals and, and mining. You may be interested in New Zealand's, and I was, and this is what it sort of looks like. <laughs> Much more agricultural. So there's, there's differences, there's some similarities. Um, you have uh, more wine than we do. So good for you, keep, keep sending it our way. We'll continue to drink it. Downtown Toronto, say on a day in January. So I know New Zealand has snow. Um, but New Zealand doesn't really have snow. Uh, so this is, a, again, downtown Toronto, a lovely uh, high park downtown. And this is after that, that same storm on the first day. So we'll see lots of pictures of Canada in cold tonight. Snow is bad. Um, ice storms are our natural disaster. Okay? So these are water falls, hits very cold surfaces like trees and uh, uh, power lines and things like that and it just accretes on it. So you get this, you know, four or five centimeters of ice on your vehicle, on trees, and it's enormously heavy and it causes enormous amounts of destruction. It can be very pretty, uh, but it's really heavy and quite disruptive. We are inextricably physically attached to the United States of America, which is very um, interesting these days. We have a lot of uh, sort of cultural um, or the U.S. has enormous cultural influence on Canada, lots of financial influence. We, we, we are the two biggest trade partners in the world. Um, and uh, it's relatively free-flowing border, although we're always concerned of sort of what happens next. So we'll go through these cases. And again, these are cases reported to us. So this is out of the, you know, on a voluntary basis for the most part. So this, our learning in these, um, our analysis in these and our ability to influence healthcare or safety is really incumbent on the altruism of the person involved who reported it to us. Their desire to help fix the system as well. So we th uh, thank them for this. We get about 5,000 incident reports for a year, uh, probably closer to about seven to 10 on some years uh, through a number of different reporting programs, individual practitioners, and consumers or community reporting program. Um, there are two web-based portals that you can put in whatever you want to put in. It's sort of a structured way. Um, we also have some from the National System for Incident Reporting, which isn't all that well uh, subscribed, but we do get some cases through that. Um, a lot of people will just pick, us, uh, pick up the phone and give us a call, or they'll email directly to one of us if they know it or if they've heard something. And we encourage people not to wait until something bad happens, if they identify some vulnerability in the system, if they have some concern about two bottles looking exactly alike, then let us know and we can sort of help, to help you or help us, you can help us influence the system here. 
Our community pharmacy program, in a lot of cases in, uh, in uh, Canada, the community pharmacies themselves subscribe to a big uh, uh, reporting program. So we have all kinds of interesting data from, from our uh, community pharmacy incident reporting. Um, a lot of which is the prescribing data. So it's actually the problem with the prescription that comes in that gets reported to us. So it's a really interesting way to learn. Um, significant number of these incident reports that come in don't have a lot of useful information. So you're not required to put any information in. You're not required to put in your name, your address, or anything like that. Um, we you know, are, are appreciative if you do, because it's helpful. The more information we have, the easier it is for us to sort of analyze the case. The, um, uh, uh, or your uh, generousness or generosity in putting your name and contact information allows us to go back to you if we have further questions. And we always treat these as confidential. Some incident reports have a lot of useful information and some don't have so much. So every Tuesday, we get together as a group, our analysis team, for a couple of hours to review the new cases that came in over the preceding, preceding week, roughly. Each case that comes in is looked at by somebody with some clinical knowledge who still actually works in, in some capacity in healthcare, whether it's a pharmacist, a nurse, a uh, physician, pharmacy tech. Our system is set up to automatically sort of highlight death cases or severe harm cases. And by far the more, most number of incidents that we get don't cause harm. So they're either near misses or no harm or very, very low level harm. And again, all incidents are re re reviewed by at least one clinician. So that's about 15,000 from uh, the community pharmacy program and about five to 7,000 a year from the other program. So, you know, 20 to a little over 20,000 a year we look at. Our team on Tuesdays consists of lots of different types of people, um, all again, who work on the, on the shop floor. And we put a number of cases forward for discussion and we use a type of uh, screening criteria to decide you know, which of these 20 odd thousand cases actually get talked about. So we always talk about death cases, even if we don't know a lot else about it. So even if it's a very, sparsely populated incident report. We'll always talk about it because maybe it triggers something. We always look at cases with respect to severity. So the more severe ones, we're more likely to talk about. And it's not necessarily so that something terrible happened or something severe happened, but hey, there's a potential for something terrible to happen here. Um, if something we recognize is happening a lot, if the frequency is high, we'll always talk about that too. Sometimes we're not sure, so we'll sort of put it in our own clinical context to see how often this happens. Um, novelty, if there's something new and unusual, we'll always talk about it. So when all the new inhalers came out, okay, one of our first reports was the aspiration one, and these are new inhalers, not all of us had used them or prescribed them. So we talked about that and we were very interested and it sort of led to that bulletin. Sometimes we do projects for other people or different types of, we're commissioned to do different types of projects. And if we have cases related to that, we'll usually always talk about them. And sometimes it's just a gut feeling, like, hmm, there's something in this case, you know, maybe we should talk about it. So, you know, like you did as medical students or pharmacy students or, or whatnot, you present the case. You get whatever data you can, you present the case, you talk about it, and we all talk about it. And we use sort of a framework in which to make sure we don't miss anything, to make sure we capture the big points. Um, and really what we want to do is what happened, understand what happened, determine why, how it happened. And we do a lot of timelining, a lot of diagramming. Um, we use what we sort of talked about this morning, some human factors theory to see, try and guess what went wrong. And you know, our big question is, so what do you think happened in these, in these uh, cases? And what we want to do at the end is really think about things that we can reduce the risk of recurrence. And our big testing question is, had this suggestion, this recommendation been in place at that time, would it have prevented the incident from happening? And it's really sort of nice if we can say yes. We use this uh, framework, which is the Canadian Incident Analysis Framework. It has really 
three big frameworks in it, the comprehensive cases. These are the ones if we're commissioned by a coroner's office or medical examiner's office or a hospital or you know, some government entity to do a really big investigation about a case. So we use the comprehensive one. Concise one is the one we'll use most often. It's you know, more concise. And sometimes, um, particularly if the cases are things we've come across before, or if they uh, don't have a lot of information, sometimes we'll use them in what's called multi-incident analysis, where we agglomerate a number of similar things or along a similar theme, like the same type of drug or the same type of situation or errors happening on a, you know, a weekend. Um, we'll do a multi-incident analysis like that to see if we can find anything interesting to uh, write about. Concise analysis is essentially straightforward, is we you know, present a case or have a narrative description along a timeline, and we talk about this case. And we try to identify factors like task, um, what was it about the work being done that might have led to an error, is there something about the equipment, the work environment, is it something about the care team, you know, is there some culture issues or the organization? Is there other ones or something about the patient? So this is essentially to make sure that we don't really miss any, anything. We don't have the blind spot. And we do a lot of diagramming and drawing. And this is kind of a picture out of that framework book. So it has all those things, task, equipment, um, you know, work environment. And we sort of trace that, so along the findings. So this led to this, led to this, led to this, which eventually contributed to the incident. And really what you want to do is determine what the contributing factors were to the incident. And we really do diagram this. Sometimes we do it very quickly, sometimes we just do it in their heads. Anything complicated, we'll have to do this for. So identify the contributing factors. We map to previous work had previous work, if we have guidance on the issues at hand, we'll sort of offer that to people. And we always determine an outcome for the case. So what do we, after we've talked about the case, we've thought of some recommendations, what do we want to do? Um, do we want to write an alert? Do we want to send this to everybody right away? Can we write a, a bulletin on it? Um, do we need more information? Sometimes we do, and we can contact the reporter. Um, should we respond directly to a reporter, in particular if we've already done work in this area or if we you know, already know what we're going to say, we'll recommend, you know, we'll send them copies of the bulletins or other work that we've done. Sometimes we have to contact you know, other stakeholders, whether it's regulatory colleges, um, whether it's uh, our, our regulator, whether it's a drug manufacturer, and sometimes it's just as simple as you know, people have reported concerns about the way this is packaged. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're always happy to work with uh, drug manufacturers and they, you know, they're typically quite receptive to have what we have to say. They sometimes don't, uh, don't change things though. So we also sometimes don't do much with the case. It sort of goes into our database for further analysis down the road. And we always look backwards about once a year to see if we've missed anything. This is kind of our frequency of occurrence versus degree of harm chart. So. Um, on the bottom there, there's something that never happens and doesn't cause any harm. It's in the green area, so this is something we probably won't do a lot of work on. It's not a high priority. Something at the diagonal area where something that always happens and that causes death, well, that, you know, we have to get to work on that right away. So something that sort of occasionally happens, causes severe harm, will probably fall within that sort of red area and we'll want to do something right away. Something that doesn't cause harm but always happens, so something at the top there. Um, you know, even though it doesn't cause harm and it's always happening, we'll probably at least investigate a little bit because it may be indicative of other things in the system that they set up causing recurrent errors. Thankfully, nothing's causing harm yet. Something that never happens but causes death, or something that rarely, rarely, rarely happens that causes death, you know, we're often not quite sure to do about that, but often we will write about it because sometimes it triggers other reports, other similar reports coming in. So it sort of spurs some action. And I'll go through all of these things that I talked about for a few cases. Uh, this is about 20 minutes from my house, and uh, this is uh, one of my favorite places to cross-country ski. Um, this is not actually, whoever went through this is not on cross-country skis, they're on a dog sled. So this is an also a nice dog sledding trail. 
So our first case is one we sort of visited earlier this morning. It's a 69-year-old man receives the hydromorphone 10 milligrams instead of morphine after his horseback riding accident, and he dies in the family car on the way home. So this was reported to us. We were actually asked to do an investigation on this. You know, and then we ask ourselves, so what do you think happened? And in this case, you know, it may be quite simple. It may be someone mistook the morphine for hydromorphone. And this was the order. You investigate a bit more. So this was what was written on the emergency chart. So that's M-O-R-P-H, a scratchy 10, I-M. So morph 10 milligrams I-M. So when you do some further investigation or for some further discussion, um, certainly look-alike, sound-alike names. So hydromorphone and morphine were often confused initially when it first came out on the market. Um, certainly the frequent use of abbreviations uh, contributed to the problem here. At the time, though, when you sort of studied the work patterns and when you talked to the nurses, um, she was distracted by another patient as she was reaching in the medicine cabinet or the narcotics cabinet for the drug. Uh, the person was confused and about to fall off a stretcher. This was 72 hours, this emergency department was on overload. There were people on stretchers in the hall, people sitting on the floor. A um, number of the staff were on their second and third shift. There was also in this case a lack of understanding about the potency of hydromorphone because they weren't using it. And of course the availability in hydromorphone despite infrequent use, something we've heard before. So if you look at um, how the drugs were stored, so this is their storage. One of these is morphine, one of these is hydromorphone. And it's a little bit deceptive in this picture um, because of the flash sort of illuminated it too much. So the, the darkness of the cabinet, underneath the cabinet there, it's a little bit dark. So that's what the cabinet looked like without the flash. So the lighting wasn't good. The storage conditions weren't good. They were stored right together, these drugs. And at least some of them have uh, no uh, flaps on the, on the boxes. And when you take them out, they're both little uh, glass uh, ampules. So they look identical. So you can appreciate how you're reaching back to get something, you notice a patient falling off a stretcher, you pull it out, you snap it off, and you carry it with you without knowing that you've taken the wrong drug. So we, we do this sort of analytic work, we talk about it, and we are trying to identify sort of all the domains that might have contributed to this. And there's more, but this is a sort of a sample of it. So, you know, certainly task problems, time pressure, it's emergency department, lots of things going on. You've got to move patients in quickly. You're already 72 hours behind. Um, equipment factors, certainly poor organization, the legibility, the use of abbreviations. Um, in this case, at this time, there was no independent double check of your drug or your dose or your patient. So that's uh, is something that was since instituted. The work environment, again, it's not lit well, lots of distractions and patient characteristics, the patient was opioid naive, and there's some other things. Hydromorphone was rarely used, but stock. So and some of these bullet can be placed in different categories, and you can probably think of more, but this is just the way we think for these things in order not to miss something. So now that we've kind of sorted out some of the contributing factors, you can sort of think about the hierarchy of effectiveness and come up with some strategies that might help. So I'll present for each case a few different ones. Um, they may not all be complete, but it just gives you a sample, a sense of, of what we do. So some of the forcing functions and constraints in this was, you know, like we've talked about before, they weren't using hydromorphone, so get it out of the emergency department. So if it was not there, you would have only been able to select morphine. Um, Segregate, uh, what we still recommend if you're using both hydromorphone and morphine is keep them far away from each other. So you're, if you're reaching to one, it's less likely you're going to select the other one. Um, come up with some acute pain protocols so that people aren't tempted to just write morph 10 milligrams. Um, independent double checks are, you know, particularly with those high alert medications or high risk medications are important. And some rules and policies is set up, you know, some system to reduce distraction. So either if you're preparing medications, you're in a separate room, or there's, there's some other indicator that you're not to be bothered. It's not always possible. 
right? It's a lower leverage, but it's a good thing to try. So when you sort of plot it on our map at that time, about, uh, I can't remember, 10, 15 years ago, um, this did occasionally happen. We got reports you know, relatively frequently from this, and in a lot of cases it did cause death. So it's in that sort of area that we'd want to do something about. Uh, June 2004, um, so we wrote about that, and we broadcast that to all our, our network, and uh, we tried to influence hospitals and hospital systems to make some changes. And what we learned from that is still, at that time, look-alike and sound-alike between hydromorphone and morphine was a big problem. Also, how you organized your storage of these medicines was also a big problem. And independent double checks, uh, which were not in place at that time, we felt probably would have uh, contributed to increased safety during that. So that's the first case. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? And I'll, I'll stop at the end of each case, and you can sort of throw something my way if you have something. If you don't, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember that, I'm sorry. I think he was there for about six hours. No, not six hours after, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that timeline escapes me, but that's a good point. Yeah, so if you had a protocol, pain protocol, you'd want that observation period, and you'd want a part of the protocol, some education if, you know, you become oversomnolent or whatnot, yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. Yes. So is there any way to get to sort of a later time? Yeah, so we, yes, moving away from illegible handwriting or probably handwriting in general is an excellent way to go. Um, part of the reason why we, we sort of suggested some acute pain protocol would be to, you know, just check marks. Yeah, tick boxes, you know, but you have to make sure that, you know, your selection when you check is actually a safe one. So there's, you know, that's when you do the FMEA, you look for the failure modes in the future. Is someone going to check all boxes and is someone going to give everything? So, yeah, so moving away from that is good. A lot of emergency, there's still a lot in Canada, most emergency departments are handwritten charts. Yeah, and that might be helpful if you're ordering, but again, if, if you're selecting the wrong drug, the tall man might not help, but, but you're right, yeah. Yes? Sorry, um, um, just about the epidemic double check. Yes. So that was a recommendation that came down nationally. How well was that picked up, I guess? And yeah, how, um, was there kind of pushback? You know, they, yeah. Yeah, it's another thing they have to do, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So we would we recommended that each facility develop their own list of high alert drugs, which are all roughly the same, like morphins, insulins, opioids. Um, do a robust, independent double check. Um, it, and what we suggested too is not just nurses, but whoever is able to sort of help. Either it's pharmacists, physicians can do this check. And it evolved along the way to not all opioids, but just the injectable ones. Um, so each sort of hospital facility took a different path. But I agree with you, it's, it's labor and time intensive to do a proper, robust, independent double check but it was relatively well received um, and it's still a very powerful tool that we use a lot in, in, uh, in uh, practice in Canada. Yes? Just one thing that might, might be used to New Zealand, like the, what the doctor will not do is that uh, we have generics, we've got a particular brand of generics in New Zealand, which, which APO is one of the Yes. And then the generic name. So, you know, use, and so some of them are called, that's just a, a generic away, it's a hydro, so it's a hydrochloride. Yeah. And if 
Yeah, yeah, and that, that's a problem in Canada. Um, this is Montreal in, in the winter. Um, case number two is, yeah, we'll get a case like that, I think number three. So an elderly male admitted with COPD. The family thoughtfully brought in his bag of medications, all his inhalers, Ramipril, ASA, eye drops, clonazepam, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide. The admitting orders were completed based on that pile of bottles that were brought into the hospital. A few days later, despite being appropriately treated with not too much oxygen, he was somnolent and confused. What do you think happened? Yes, I heard that. So the patient on his list was ordered clonazepam, two milligrams twice a day, but the bottle was dispensed three years ago, and he never actually took anything. So the family did the right thing, the patient did the right thing, brought this thing in, but you know, unfortunately an error happened. The family brought it in. The patient was distressed. He wasn't, you know, incapacitated, so they could have talked to him. Um, no discussion with the patient. No independent verification of medications. That's good medication reconciliation. No pharmacist review of mission medications, which we do very well now in Canada. Um, patient kept the medication bottle. People always keep medications and they just hang on to them. It's, I don't know, it's like a heirloom or something. Um, and there was a new MedRec form for the emergency department. So this allowed, you know, uh, the pharmacist, whoever was doing the medication reconciliation, to list all the medications. The prescriber would come and just check off things and sign the bottom. So it was meant sort of as a convenience thing for the prescriber. So when you look, talk about it, when you look through it, you know, certainly emergency department, again, time pressure to get people moving. There was no pharmacist review at that time with these things with these MedRec. There was a new med medication reconciliation form. Um, there were some patient factors. Again, no discussion with the patient or no independent verification of the true medication list. So if you think about the hierarchy of effectiveness in whatever form you prefer, um, we don't have the national medication chart but that would have probably been helpful here, particularly if it can flag sort of um, historical prescription, so three-year-old prescription never refilled would be uh, important to catch. And good, robust medication reconciliation. And what they have now in most hospitals that works very well is very early pharmacist review of, of treatment and uh, review of any duplicative therapy. So we thought this did happen fairly often and we wrote a uh, bulletin on it about quality medication reconciliation process are critical, although we could have written about a number of different topics here. And what we learned is um, the independent verification of the medication list is very important because people don't take things as prescribed. And um, often uh, there's a trade-off between convenience and safety. So this was the new medication reconciliation form was made for the convenience of the physician in the emergency department. And it was far too easy just to run your pen down and sign the bottom without giving it any thought. Any questions, comments about that case? You're eager to see the next picture. So this is uh, the 401, which is the largest highway in Canada, and I travel this mostly every day. This is after a snowstorm, and there's one snowplow on just the bottom, you can just see the, the top of it, and there's 11 snowplows there. And so uh, it takes me two, two, two to three hours to get home on nights like this. Um, and uh, the other lesson here is Canada spends enormous amounts of money moving snow from the road to the side of the road. So case three um, is within a hospital, service transfer. So an elderly female with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, admitted with uh, acute coronary event, um, treated conservatively. These are medications, atenolol, methotrexate weekly, torvastatin, perindopril, prednisone, uh, celecoxib, hydroxychloroquine, folic acid, and some vitamins and calcium and ASA. Did very well. 
sort of settled down and was transferred to the general ward. A few days later, despite being appropriately treated with not too much oxygen, um, she was somnolent, confused, and deteriorating, and despite, you know, good investigations, really no obvious cause um, for the deterioration. So does anybody have any idea here? Okay, that's an excellent one. That's not what happened here. Uh, there's her medication list. This is a medication safety talk, so it's probably going to be a medication. That's the answer. So prednisone was not reordered on a transfer. For whatever reason, it got dropped. So again, the same sort of things that we visited in last case. So even within the hospital now, when someone changes services, you do have to reorder everything. And we do now, in most cases, have a very early pharmacist review of treatment. So at this point, no pharmacist review, transfer medications. Again, minimal science review by the accepting physician and no internal med rec processes to make sure that treatment in one service area is appropriately continued in another service area. So again, very similar things we would suggest is the medication information programs, even within a hospital, need to be uh, set up in a way that these therapies are continued appropriately. Uh, and again, robust med rec. So med rec errors happen within facilities is a lesson, and every transition point is a risk. And again, another um, thing to think about here is if someone's clinical path is not what you expect it, it may actually be a medication error rather than, you know, an infection or some other event or some other physiologic insult. Um, questions about this case? So this is not me skiing. However, I wish it were me skiing. Case four is discharge. So this is an elderly male with uh, chronic AFib, and he's on warfarin. He's got a little bit of you know, congestive heart failure. He had developed a pneumonia in the community and consequently some fluid overload. Um, quite well in the emergency department, responded to IV antibiotics, um, and was discharged home after a few days with, uh, you know, with some, an oral prescri or a prescription for oral antibiotics a new dose of warfarin, and a new dose of uh, furosemide, or Lasix, and was out in the community. And uh, he came back a few days later um, with acute renal failure and an INR of 11. Both bad. So um, any ideas what happened? Okay, uh, warfarin antibiotic interaction is a possibility. Um, no, he did not get his INR tested. And, sorry? Okay, wrong strength of tablets. Yes, that's good. That's good. Haha. <laughs> so this was the best patient in the world. So he listened to everything you said and wanted to follow your rules exactly. So he did take his prescribed antibiotics, like right to the second to the right, right time. He also took his warfarin in addition to his usual Coumadin at home. He did take his prescribed furosemide in addition to his novosemide, which is you know, the same um, entity um, same thing, uh, furosemide, but like the APO example you gave, sound, looks a bit, sounds a bit different. So he sort of essentially took double therapy of all these things. So what we found out is, you know, he's otherwise a terrific patient, uh, listens to you exactly. Um, some of the confounding factors here, some of the investigative findings, contributing factors. Um, multiple different sources of medications. So he went to the discharge pharmacy that was open closest to the hospital rather than his own community pharmacy. So they did not have the same medication list. There is no such national medication chart. Multiple names for the same medications as we've talked about. No discharge counseling process and no med rec processes for discharges. 
So this is where we sort of you know, encourage people to do medication re reconciliation as people are leaving the hospital. We're in the hospital when they switch services in the hospital and when they leave hospital. So we would recommend very similar things. Um, and a lot of places in Canada now have early follow-up, even if it's just a phone call, by pharmacists and nurses to people recently discharged. So med racket discharge is very important, and I think, you know, critically so, because you're sending the patient out into the great unknown, and you don't know what's going to happen to them. In particular, what's at home now that they may take, continue to take, anything that's changed, and anything that they should definitely stop or start. Any questions about this one? Comments? Sorry? Health literacy, Health literacy. yes, yes. Um, trying to get through the snow. Um, case five uh, is an elderly woman presenting with left shin pain and a large left shin skin lesion. So this is really inflamed. It looks painful. It looks quite ugly. Um, it's really, to the people involved, it was undiagnosable. It's ulcerated. They do a biopsy. There's no malignancy there. They culture it. There's nothing much to find. There's just a lot of inflammation, and it's all really the pathologist can tell you. Um, gets better in hospital over three weeks without any particular treatment. Um, and the patient gets discharged. Um, comes back almost in an identical fashion about three months later, but it's worse. So it's almost to the bone now, and it's necrotic. It's looking, you know, really quite miserable. Finally, she comes to a baloney amputation. So you have to decide to take it off because it looks terrible. Gets better over a month or so, and then she gets discharged again. So, but... Six months later, she comes back, and the stump is open, it's necrotic, it's miserable, and she now has evidence of sort of renal dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, and brain dysfunction, and eventually spends a long time in hospital and just dies of, of complications related to hospitalization. So this is a tough one, but what do you think happened? Okay, oh, you're on the right track. She's self-treating with something. Sorry? Okay, yeah, yeah, possibility. So if I do this? <clears throat> so it's a, you know, it's a heat rub, methyl salicylate, and some camphor and whatever other concoctions in there. So um, when the family's cleaning out her room in her house, there's hundreds of empty bottles of these things and empty tubes, and there's evidence that she'd been buying it sort of by the case, really. Um, and the family kind of knew that she'd been using a lot of it all the time. And whenever the family brought her to hospital, it was always in her you know, bag of medications that they brought in. But you know, talking to the people, no, we never did ask the family about these things. And it's kind of like the oxygen example we saw this morning. It's, you know, it may not be thought of as a therapeutic drug. It may not be thought of as an actual treatment that we should be worried about, over-the-counter things. So ultimately, the coroner told us that she died of complications of hospitalization, secondary to toxicity and caustic chemical burns from methyl salicylate, camphor and menthol, evidence of widespread salicylate toxicity. So she had been using this stuff all the time on whatever ailed her. So really the big contributing factor here is the med rec process paid no attention to non-prescribed medications. And that was in their, in their forms too as they collected information. There wasn't an area for over-the-counter medications. So really, you know, good med rec is really helpful here, and certainly an understanding that over-the-counter medications or topical agents can have really important effects. And we should think of these things as a medication. So some of the lessons, um, again, they have systemic effects, and certainly not all patients will use the medications as directed. And if we think about all the previous uh, cases, uh, they're all sort of med reconciliation related. 
In transfers of care, I think the point is they're very vulnerable time for patients. And certainly not everybody takes medications as directed. So any questions about that case or the previous few about MedRec? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, lack of pharmacists? Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly, certainly no shortage of community pharmacists. There is a bit of a shortage of hospital pharmacists. So this is a free snowman, some assembly required. <laughs> so a 32-year-old gentleman in the emergency department uh, one night for nonspecific back pain. Um, given IV opioids as treatment over the course of the night. Um, investigations really don't, you know, amount to much. There's certainly nothing dangerous or ominous going on. Starts to feel better in the morning and gets discharged at 7.30. Um, 9 o'clock uh, goes to bed and doesn't wake up for lunch and is checked upon and he's, he's found dead. So at noon, a few hours later. So what do you think happened? Anybody? Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, if I put, this was the medication administration record. So um, you see a number of them here. Any number of administrations of morphine, anywhere from milligrams. The coroner's report, no other findings except death from opioid toxicity. So the order that allowed this to happen was two milligrams, dilated is hydromorphone. So um, hydromorphone or dilated two milligrams PO now, which was the first, first drug there, and then morphine one to three milligrams PRN. So this was the unrestricted order that sort of allowed like, I, we really could not explain why there's a five and a four administered there. Um, but, I mean, part of, the point, part of the point is it's an unrestricted order, lots of degrees of freedom. There's, you know, nothing. There's not even a route specified in this order. And when discussing this amongst a number of coroners, one of them raised the point that, well, one to three milligrams morphine PRN, you know, you can essentially have a continuous infusion. Right? There's absolutely no restrictions. <clears throat> so ambiguous opioid order, multiple caregivers, I think, played a role in this case, an emergency department where you, you know, nurses rotate in and out. Um, certainly no restrictions, no ranges on order. And there wasn't really an appreciation of uh, the cumulative dose of opioid that this gentleman got, an otherwise opioid naive person, and looked well enough when they went home but for every reason died of opioid toxicity. And there was, because there's a consideration that there, he took in some stuff later or been prescribed something, but there was no evidence ever that found. So um, forcing function here or constraint would be a precise and limited and appropriate order, um, which one of the ways you may have that is from a, you know, an acute pain protocol or some sort of pain protocol, um, as well as, Structured patient care teams in emergency departments or high intensity departments, and some better patient handover communication tools so that everybody, the next person knows how much he's actually gotten. Um, and essentially, uh, these ambiguous orders can be dangerous. And we have a few similar um, samples of things like this in our, uh, in our case files. Um, any questions about this one? No. There's a maximum dose. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent idea. Yeah. 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 So it, if it's filled in, is the response. Um, there is now, there are protocols now for observation periods after the last dose of, of IV medication. Yes, yeah. 
So um, my car is in here somewhere. <laughs> um, case seven is a female patient underwent uncomplicated hysterectomy. Um, one hour you know, prior to the OR, started on fluids because she had not been you know, eating for the last 12 hours or whatnot. Started on two thirds and a third, which is uh, dextrose and saline at 150 milliliters per hour. Um, surgery went well, it was uncomplicated, no trouble. Um, over the next day, while admitted, began to feel unwell, sort of became hypertensive, developed a headache. Um, the next morning, um, you know, the staff noted decreased uh, urine output, so phoned the on-call physician and the physician said, well, give another bolus of this, uh, this uh, fluid. A few hours later, the patient became unresponsive. Uh, the CT head at that time showed significant uh, brain edema and uh, ultimately went to the ICU where care was withdrawn and she died. So anybody have any ideas what happened here? Okay, possibility. Okay. Possibility. So if I tell you her admission sodium was 146, and her sodium um, when she first got admitted to the ICU was 118, so 36 hours. So that's a really significant drop in, in sodium um, over 36 hours. And the coroner's cause of death, severe brain edema, brain swelling due to rapid development of hyponatremia. So some of the contributing factors in this case, and they're very similar to the oxygen case that was presented today. So we often don't think of fluids as you know, meaning much in terms of care, and people will often start and stop them without a thought of what they're doing. And they often will um, discriminate or distinguish between fluids for treatment, like if you're trying to fix their potassium or if they're dehydrated or something, you'll pay more attention than fluids for maintenance. So this was initially considered a fluid for maintenance, that IV two thirds and a third over the operating period. And then again, it just happened to be continued without much thought. So the maintenance fluids, oh, it's just because they're not eating rather than treatment. So there was, you know, use of the hypotonic IV fluids, which some people will argue you shouldn't ever use except in very specific circumstances. So no electrolyte monitoring, no systematic electrolyte monitoring of people post-op or people on fluids for replacement. Um, fluid status, um, like, uh, like Chris said this morning about oxygen, about hypercapnia, um, some manifestations of hyponatremia were missed at this time as well. So um, forcing functions, there's a movement in Canada to avoid in the operating room or even as maintenance solutions, hypotonic fluid, unless there's a real clinical reason to use them. And uh, also um, not automatically carry over OR fluid orders that just sort of continue until discharge. Some other ones there as well. Um, we thought that this happened fairly often and it clearly can cause harm and it probably happens more often than we think. So we wrote a bulletin on it about hospital acquired hyponatremia, which spurred a, uh, some interest and a lot of discussion. So we set up a, a web page based on that where hospitals can give us their ideas or share ideas about what they do for, for hyponatremia. So fluids are a treatment, really, like oxygen and even like topical agents, things we don't expect to cause much uh, physiologic effect. Um, avoid the use of hypotonic solutions postoperatively. You know, there may be some controversy here, um, but it seems to be the way things are going in Canada and some parts of the US. Monitor electrolytes. And we often think of uh, hyponatremia causing uh, brain swelling as a, as a kid's problem, but it can occur in any age. Um, any questions about that one? Yeah, we never found out, but it was routine practice. Yeah, yeah, it was routine practice amongst you know a certain number of anesthesiologists at that time to use it. 
So this is um, Ottawa, the nation's capital, and there's a nice canal uh, there, and it freezes every winter, like everything else in Canada. And uh, it becomes a seven kilometer skating rink. So you can skate all the way through the city from one end to another um, with a uh, nice hot chocolate. Um, case eight is a elderly nursing home resident with palliative breast cancer. Um, she's bedridden, unable to swallow, um, has a G-tube for, for most of her ingestion. Um, she's prescribed MS Contin, 15 milligrams twice a day for increasing pain. Uh, a little bit while later, she starts to vomit, um, sort of diminished blood pressure, diminished level of consciousness, more lethargic, and approximately three days later, she dies. So what, what do you think happened here? You guys are so smart. So yes, the MS Contin was being crushed to deliver to the patient. So instead of the delivery of 15 milligrams over 12-ish hours, all that 15 milligrams was delivered at once. So the interesting thing is that everybody involved in the care knew that you weren't supposed to crush the MS Contin. That was sort of well established in everyone's minds. And, but the problem was that they didn't know how to proceed beyond that. So they didn't, the culture at this place was frankly not very good, the safety culture, workplace culture. And it was somewhat forbidden or you put yourself at risk if you question anybody uh, above you. So they knew they couldn't, but they still wanted to help this person. So they did it anyway. So it wasn't out of any sense of malfeasance or horrible deviation from norm, although that happened. It was, you know, this makes sense to us at the time because of all these other external factors. So some of the contributing factors, of course, is crushing, non-crushable. Um, the prescriber didn't really understand the consequences of writing non-crushable medication. And, you know, didn't really understand there was, not, was such a thing because all the other medicines had been easily crushed and appropriate. And this was the first one for this woman that was a non-crushable medication. And there are alternatives to the MS Cotton that you, you can't necessarily crush, but you can split up. Uh, the pharmacy that filled this order for the, that institution wasn't aware of any swallowing restrictions. So there's a lack of communication among everybody. And of course, the safety culture played a big role in this case. So um, subsequently, with their computer ordering system uh, on their system, you cannot order something crushable for someone who can't take a crushed medication or some reason why you can't take a crushed medication. So that's sort of your computerized, almost a forcing function where it just can't be ordered. Um, there's a lot better communication and certainly a lot better communication with pharmacies so that if they try to order a, crush, a non crushable medication, that, that'll be flagged and they can suggest alternatives. So, um, certainly these two things were big lessons. Uh, the safety culture and workplace culture was, was uh, worked upon significantly here. Um, any questions with that one? Yeah, safety culture. Um, sliding on a wonderful March day. Case nine, um, someone mentioned health literacy earlier. Um, this is a recently immigrated elderly male, started on insulin for diabetes. Um, patient didn't understand any English. Um, so the uh, family took over insulin administration and monitoring. And regimen was, you know, relatively simple, twice a day, insulin and pH, um, with uh, uh, glucose monitoring associated with that, just to keep track of it. Um, things were going well. However, one evening, um, the reading was less than two. And so the family sort of dutifully gave another 10 units of insulin. Um, later that night, the, the patient was quite weak, slurred speech, certainly not himself. So the sons took the glucose level again, um, and it was less than one. So they gave him another dose of the insulin 
um, and the mistaken belief that this would help is diabetes. And some of these cases are to purposely sort of trigger in your mind that this made sense to these people at this time, okay? It's always to think about, put yourself in their shoes, what are they seeing? So and what they knew about diabetes was it had something to do with sugars, okay? And they knew that low sugars were bad. So what helps diabetes? Well, it's insulin. So low sugars are bad. We need something that's gonna help diabetes, so we'll give him more insulin. Patient found dead, and you kind of know what happened, severe hypoglycemia. So this, this case is, really shows a, a lack of understanding of treatment, a lack of understanding of the glucose readings, although they did know that low sugars were bad, high, high sugars were bad as well. But there was no plan for either of them. There's no plan for too low or too high. Lack of understanding of the effects of insulin, so insulin drives down sugar. Certainly a language barrier. And what we see in a number of, of medication errors, particularly with parents and children or caregivers and, and patients, is the treatment through someone else. So the vicarious treatment, the surrogate treatment. So patients rely on other people to interpret their signs or to make management decisions for them that sometimes is, sort of introduces vulnerabilities. Um, so certainly this is all health literacy. So written plans or oral plans in a language and at a level that the patient understands and take the opportunity to confirm recipient's knowledge by some sort of teach back mechanism or use what you have been doing in, in health literacy um, like co-design with a group of patients, particularly the group of patients that you want to reach, sort of in this case recent immigrants. Um, questions about that case? So this is uh, Niagara Falls, of course, uh, probably in a February day. And the bottom will freeze, and there's still nice water there. Um, too cold to swim, though. <laughs> Next case, um, patient given in error five milligrams of hydromorphone um, in the emergency department um, was in, I can't remember the reason, was in one of those little curtains. Um, 30 minutes later, though, uh, the error was recognized when the patient was noted to be oversedated. So they gave him, a, a, by accident, some hydromorphone. Uh, came back a little while later, he's zonked out. Um, somebody realizes this and gives him naloxone. And sure enough, he, he perks up, feels much better. So they go on and do other things and come back to him 73 minutes later. He's dead. Um, opioid toxicity is a cause of death, um, single dose naloxone only. So, and he responded very well, and then they went, everybody went about their business. So, lack of follow up assessment, lack of continued monitoring, lack of familiarity in this case with naloxone, um, and no naloxone protocol for this emergency department. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about those. So, um, you know, people will argue about the numbers or depending on what, what sources you use. Um, this is the approximate duration of effectiveness, and if you like graph better, um, the point is naloxone is much smaller or much shorter acting duration than any of these drugs. And if you, you know, get into things like methadone, um, which has enormous half-life, it can, can be days and days of, of naloxone use. So some of the things that have been instituted in Ontario particularly, if you use, use naloxone, it's an automatic upgrade in your status to full monitoring. Okay, so you do have um, um, that type of forcing function, or some may argue it's actually automatic or automation. So you use naloxone, you get full monitoring. Um, more and more naloxone protocols that can be implemented by anybody. So respiratory techs, uh, ward clerks, anybody. So they're all, it's much more available now, and it's a step-by-step -step path that you can use for naloxone, which includes all the things you need to know about increasing intensity of care, about repeated doses, or, or drips. And this includes sometimes some naloxone alarms. So if you give naloxone, you have a 15-minute alarm that's preset, and you just punch it, and you go back in every 15 minutes. And um, at the time in Ontario, this was happening uh, relatively often and had caused death. 
So we did write a bulletin on it, um, sort of about a systems approach to setting up these protocols. Um, in some of our lessons, uh, I think, uh, which would be the same as, as yours, um, continuous monitoring, you need that. Repeated doses, you'll, you're going to almost always need that as well. And at the time, there was unfamiliarity. So um, I don't think there's that much now. And we also learned that um, certainly in the ICU, they have naloxone protocols and infusions, which sort of direct how much intense care you need. But outside of that, um, there wasn't a lot, and in particular, a lot of the harm was happening in general wards, so post-surgical wards or medical wards, and they didn't have this resource, the protocols, or the abil ability to activate this very quickly. So, so now they do. Um, questions about this one? Okay. Does anybody know what these are? Yeah, ice fishing huts. Yes, do you guys go ice fishing here? So these are ice fishing huts. So you tow them out or you drive them out into the middle of the frozen lake. Um, most of them are on skis or some sort of sled. There's a hole in the bottom and you drill through the hole and then you drill through the ice and you know, it's upwards of you know, three to six feet thick and then you put your line in and you catch fish. And you can sit there with your hot chocolate <laughs> catching fish. No. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, and, and people will honestly will fight for the best spots, even if they're within a few yards of each other, me meters. So this is um, a different sort of case. This is uh, ca case 11. This is about 75 children fall suddenly ill after receiving immunizations for measles, it was MMR, in Syria. And this was about five years ago, and some of you may uh, remember this. Um, Fifteen of these children, unfortunately, die, which is probably, uh, uh, you know, a um, uh, few compared to what could have happened. Um, because of respiratory distress, some type of paralysis, and, and sort of generalized edema. Um, given the little limited resources in Syria, it was sort of more of a clinical picture, but there was some toxicology. And the clinical picture was, looked like neuromuscular blockade. So what do you think happened? Or who delivers immunizations? And how do you make up an MMR? So what do you, what do you think happened? So um, what had happened, the WHO, in their interim report, their preliminary investigation, determined that atricurium, the neuromuscular blocker, had been substituted for the, the diluent in these vaccination packs that they make. So the healthcare workers would take out the powder and take out the diluent, then suck up the diluent in the syringe, then the powder, mix it up, and inject it. So what had happened is it was not diluent, it was you know, the paralyzing agent, neuromuscular blocker. So they would suck up a, a mil or half mil of the neuromuscular blocker, then the powder, and then inject it into the child. So we don't know exactly what they look like because we've never been able to get pictures, although we've worked on this case. Um, but this is sort of some examples. So there's the dose of the, the, the MMR in the middle there. This is what the atricurium vial looks like. So, you know, in this case, there's not, you know, some maybe look alike, sound alike, or look alike anyway, but we're not sure what they look like. We have never been able to get a picture. But certainly some of the contributing factors we had suggested was I mean, in Syria at that time, and, and now, in fact, there's very limited cold storage that you can do, right? Their whole infrastructure, their healthcare infrastructure is not very good, so you, you know, things that we would not accept here in North America, you may have to live with to deliver care in Syria. Certainly a lot of cold chain restrictions, so they may not have separate fridges for separate medications like we would, you know, we might have here in, uh, in you know, more, more higher, or higher income countries. 
And again, even we thought that even if they're labeled differently, even if they spell differently, not all healthcare workers may be able to discriminate, you know, is this the dilly one or not? And they were used to having these packs of 10 powders and 10 diluents, so they just would automatically take the, the diluent, the powder, and inject. So there's some system issues here. And whether or not double checking at the point of loading these vaccination packs might have helped, we can't say. But it's an important issue, and this is some of the terrible harm that can come. And these are some of the balances between feasibility and effectiveness that you have to play out in different types of environments. Um, and some of the ones we might do is never store or transport neuromuscular blockers with other medications. Um, in some cases, double change in chamber syringes would be much easy, but again, those are quite expensive, so they may not be available everywhere. Barcoding. Barcoding is surprisingly available in lower and middle income countries because m most people have some type of smartphone that can read it. So that's an opportunity there maybe to use that. In Canada and much of the US, 100% of neuromuscular blockers have paralyzing agents on the cap and on the ferrule. And that's um, decreased the number but not eliminated the number. Uh, and we know from this case that, again, look alike, sound alike, although we can't be confident that that was the case in here. Packaging and labeling, how you package things together. And this actually happens less so in Canada, but in the US, they, they get you know, a handful of reports a year about mixing up neuromuscular blockers with their drugs. So benzodiazepines, insulin, and neuromuscular blockers happen surprisingly a lot in hospitals. And certainly the depolarizing and non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers get mixed up. So these are um, terribly powerful drugs and ca can cause harm. They're high alert drugs for sure. Um, any comments or questions about that one? I wish we knew more. I wish there were, there's a preliminary report, but there's no final report. And I don't know if we'll ever see one. So um, this is the ICE Hotel. Uh, this is outside of Quebec City, and every year they, they build this hotel out of blocks of ice, and you can actually rent a room and spend a, a lovely weekend there. And uh, you may uh, ask uh, if the beds are made of ice, and I'm happy to say they are. So you can have a nice rest on that. It looks very comfortable. And um, some of you are probably asking uh, about these, and... <laughs> And yes, they are. <laughs> they are. <clears throat> so in about, uh, it's, it's November, so in about uh, six weeks, they'll start to build it. They'll start to build it. So if you're interested in coming to Quebec City in Canada, let me know how it is. <laughs> So case 12 is a child with a complex sleep disorder receiving three grams every night of tryptophan okay, to help with this disorder. So it, it had been going on for three months. They got about a month at a time of the medication. Um, things had been progressing quite nicely, actually, and, and uh, his condition had become more manageable. Um, so at the end of the third month, they go back to the pharmacy and pick up the, the new, uh, new bottle of, uh, of tryptophan, and that night the child given the usual dose, and the next morning the child was found dead in bed, sadly. So any thoughts on what happened? Hmm? Wrong strength, yeah, that's a possibility. Wrong drug, excellent. Um, Post-mortem toxicology, um, lethal levels of baclofen. Um, and in the suspension refill, it revealed no tryptophan at all, but baclofen. And baclofen at the expected dose had they made it, or made it with the tryptophan. So it was the sort of equivalent dose. So there obviously was a mistake in the compounding whereby baclofen ended up in there instead of tryptophan. And maybe you can hazard a, a, a guess why. Yeah, so all these bottles kind of look the same, right? You can see how the world conspires against you. OK, 
okay, how these, this packaging and this labeling makes it easy. So one of these is baclofen and one of these is the tryptophan. So notice the trade dress, the stuff that, you know, is part of the trademark and the, and the design of the label is most evident, but the ingredient actually is sort of small, non-specific font in the middle. And you might say, well, if I open the cap, maybe there's some difference. And I would catch the baclofen versus tryptophan, but, you know, they look exactly the same. It's a white powder, probably like all these things. So contributing factors to this case where, you know, it's not a commercially available product, so you do have to compound it, you do have to make it. It certainly look alike packaging. It's certainly the product itself looks alike. And there's lack of secondary unique identifiers on chemical packaging. So there is, um, there's the name, but there's no other barcoding, there's no other, you know, drug identification number at all to tell, help uh, practitioners tell that apart. And in this case, in the way they compounded, there's really no independent verification step. So there's no double checking of the ingredients before you mix, and not even a, a weigh scale. So forcing function was, you know, if there is a commercially available product, use that prior to, because it removes any of the vulnerabilities associated with compounding. Um, barcoding um, uh, might have been helpful here. Okay, if you can, you know, select the ingredient and you fire the barcode reader at it and it talks to you, saying baclofen, then that would be a useful double check. There is a difference in the weights of these two, so maybe weigh scales as you go along might have been helpful here. Um, certainly the independent verification by two different people acting totally independently would have been helpful here. Multiple identifiers like barcodes, like other numbers, and some packaging improvements. So we thought that this, you know, in, Canada, in the Canadian landscape in particular, um, is probably pretty important because compounding is in, in, increasing in uh, availability. So we did write a uh, bulletin on it maybe about four months ago. Um, and what we learned is there's really no strong standards for compounding in Canada. So once you become a physician, you can compound. Once you become a pharmacist, you can compound. There's no other credentialing or certification that you need. And pharmacies, pretty much every pharmacy, is increasingly compounding products as a business proposition. So if you don't like your amlodipine in the solid pill form, ph compounding pharmacies will make it for you in, you know, whatever minty flavor you like. Um, and they're packaged in, you know, the chemicals themselves, there's, in North America, there's three people, or three organizations, companies you can buy compounded products from. Um, but all ones from one company are the green, the other ones are blue, the other ones have two red stripes. So there's a long way to go with pro appropriate packaging and labeling. So this is Toronto. Um, all big uh, cities have a skating ring outside. And I'll just show you a couple more. Okay, so there's, yes, there's Toronto um, on a wintry day, but I want to show you that Canada does have summer. Um, so we particularly enjoy all two days of it. Because <laughs> um, on the third, third day, the flies come out. So thanks very much.